Okay, so welcome to the final class of our little five-week session here for Tablet for Data Journalism. Um, this week, we're going to talk about storytelling. Obviously, as journalists, storytelling is a big part of what you do, and um, exploratory dashboards are great. We create a lot of user engagement, but really, when we make data visualizations, we want them to be in support of our stories. Um, so we're going to talk about things you can do to kind of support your storytelling and um, just some little ideas. And one thing we're really going to talk about today while we do this is kind of how to reverse engineer people's dashboards. So I'm going to show you a lot of different examples of cool things people did to promote storytelling. And then we'll open up their dashboards and try to figure out how they did it. Um, I'm also going to go over kind of the graduation requirements for the class um, and some kind of benefits that I hope that you could take advantage of afterwards. And then I want to just cover, you know, obviously we, there's still so much you guys can learn about Pablo. There's no way I could have covered everything in five weeks. So I want to give you an idea of how to keep learning um, and where to go to get help. First things first. Let's talk storytelling. I've got a bunch of examples here to show you and of kind of various ways that you can support storytelling. The first example is actually from your very own classmate, Mr. Alex Walsh, who just happened to be this at the day today. Congratulations, Alex. Um, and this is a dashboard he made about prisons in Alabama. And it's pretty simple. You can see there's not a whole lot of you know, flashy stuff going on here, but I really liked the way that he did titles. Text is the easiest way to support storytelling, the way you put your text in. So he has kind of a little leading line here about how many inmates there are and about where they are. You can see a map of where they are. If you click on it, you know, it highlights in the table. And what I really liked is this. They're over capacity, dot, dot, dot and understaffed. So this right here, this is a great example of storytelling. He's taking advantage of the fact that we're going to look at this part of the dashboard first, and then this one. And he shows this is the capacity, this is the population, these are the positions that are filled, these are the ones that are authorized. Very clear-cut storytelling here. Um, another thing that's really great about this dashboard is just um, how clean it is. Sometimes really adding too much stuff can take away from the storytelling of your dashboard. So this is a great example. Shows that you don't really have to do all that much to promote storytelling. And the reason that storytelling like this can be so helpful when you're doing business, because I don't know, if we haven't really super talked about um, all these little share buttons at the bottom. You can see there's all these little share buttons. And people can click this, and they'll get a direct link to the vid. So what they'll actually see when you click the share button, if we look at what this link looks like, they'll get a page that suggests the vid. And um, if you don't have a lot of context about what the vid is about, people might not understand what the vid is about. Um, so this is a really good reason to put some information about what's happening in the viz within the viz so that when it gets shared or if it gets re-embedded somewhere else, um, people will know what's going on. Another thing that is nice to do because of this whole sharing via social media thing is try to put, you know, a little logo of your newspaper that links back to maybe the original story so that people have a way of coming in. Um, another thing you can do is set up a light box. And I can show you an example of what that looks like. Um, actually, let's save this for a little bit later. We'll talk about the kinds of things to think about before public. OK, let's stay on task here with storytelling. So that was my example from Alex here. And that shows just a little bit of text goes a long way. Um, for even more examples of how a little bit of text goes a long way. So here's a kind of goofy example of a dashboard I made about cats versus dogs. 
Um, and you can see, I didn't put a whole lot of times I said dogs are winning the battle, cats are winning the war, and kind of down here I explain what that means. But in the U.S., there's a higher percentage of dog households than cat households. However, there's more cats per household, so there's more cats in the population. So doing things like these little call-out numbers, stuff like that, that's things that help promote storytelling so that someone doesn't just look at this and not know where they're going. Um, so another thing, if you remember last week, five-second rule about someone to be able to look at your dashboard in five seconds and understand what's going on, um, you can call out numbers like this, another way to help with that five-second rule. Um, something that's even cooler to do with call-out numbers are dynamic call-out numbers. So here is another good example of how just a little text goes a long way. So in this viz about the Stop and Frisk program in New York, you can see there's just a little bit of like a kind of subtitle here about how many stops were made and how many uses of force were involved. And we have these call-out numbers here, so if we want to see how many times was a cop hand forcibly placed on a subject? Over 70,000 times in 2012. How many times was a suspect put in handcuffs? Um, so you get, this is great because you get an idea of where it happened from the map, but now you also get the hard number. And that's really the story that they're trying to tell here is, you know, it's one thing to see a lot of dots on the map and think like, oh yeah, that is a lot of force being used. and like how many times was a weapon shot against people? And you can see on the map, like, and know that there's some places that it happens more. But it's even better if you can really associate that number, that 1,300 people were all got a gun drawn on them. So let's actually take a look at this dashboard and a little bit about how it was made. So the first step you always want to do when you open up a dashboard and you're trying to reverse engineer it, just get a sense of what's a sheet and what's not. Where are the sheets? So you can see that there's five things here, five different sheets that are going in. We can guess that the force map, yep, that's the map part, that makes sense. And then we have force callout, that's the little text box there that shows the number. We have force text, which is highlighting something blank right now, but if we maybe click on this, oh, we can see that's the text that says what kind of force it was. Force picker we see is just this box here, and it looks like this is actually a sheet that's being used as a filter. And then help, that's the help button. So they made a little hover help tool here. So now that we've oriented ourselves around the map, we can say, well, what's the thing we are trying to figure out how they did? I want to know how they made these little call-out numbers. So let's go there. If you, there's two ways to get to that sheet. You can see they actually hid all the sheets here. So you can't really get to them by clicking down there like you normally would. What we can do is click on this drop down and say, go to sheet. So once you have the sheet highlighted, you click the drop down and say, go to sheet. You could also do it from this left menu here. You could right click and say go to sheet. So we can see that this first dashboard here, or this first sheet on the dashboard that's showing the number, we have a count of the type of force used. So this is just counting every line. You can basically think of this similar to number of records. Um, so they're counting the type of force. And then they're using a filter to determine which kind. So that was the filter that made, that's the filter, the action filter from this right here. So if we click one of these, it filters the count. So now it's only counting how many times someone 
place in handcuffs. So that's a pretty simple one. All they had to do is put that number there and the number will always automatically update. So what about the other call out box here that changes the text? Let's take a look at how that works. So once again, I'm going to right click here and say go to sheet. It's kind of small, I'm gonna stretch this out here. So all they did was put type of force views on the label or on text. And that's it. And then they have the filter action that's only showing one thing. If I took off the filter action, you can see it just shows all of them all at once. But when I go here and I see those dot dot dots, that means there's more data, there's more data than can be shown in how small the sheet is. If I click one of these, then it goes back to being filtered. So that's all it takes to build a call out text, really, is just taking the piece of text you want and putting it onto text. Pretty simple. Really easy way to kind of call out certain things. And of course, if you don't need it to be dynamic, you can always do things like just placing a text box or you can annotate a phrase. So if there's a, let's say there's a particular area here that we wanted to annotate. If you right click on the map, you can go to annotate. We could either pick a particular point or an area. So if we set an area, and we can say something about, this is totally made up, but time is over here, but stops are higher. You can see it kind of made this box and it's a little hard, not the, not the greatest formatting. You can format this to make it a little clearer. You make the border a little darker, maybe put some shading in it, make it a little transparent here. So you can see what's going on behind it. So now we can put this box over something else. So that's another way we can do this. We can highlight areas or we can do an annotation that points to a specific point. Make it say whatever we want there. Point the little arrow. So there's a lot of different kinds of things you can do just with text to make storytelling happen. So the question here about when you're making that filter to change um, the different callout text, you make the action on the dashboard instead of the sheet, correct? And that is correct because these are two different sheets. So the action that happens is going to be on this sheet. Let's just take a look at how they made this. Um, what they called a force picker. I like to think of it as kind of a control button. So you can see they actually just made squares for each of the force used. And what this is is actually just a normal table here that they hid in the header. So if we say show header here, the way they got them to stack vertically like that is that these are actually in rows. And then they just hid this column so that all you're left with is the boxes. So you could use this like any other sheet and do dashboard actions on it. If we take a look at their dashboard actions here, you can see that they have a filter that filters the call out here. That when you select something on the picker, it filters the, the call out. That's all they did here. Okay, let's look at some other kind of different ways that people do storytelling. This dashboard was by a Pablo author named Matt Francis. Um, if you start getting into the community, you'll see his name all the time because he's a super big tweeter. He's all over the place. Um, I really enjoyed this dashboard that he recently made um, because it's a great example of storytelling. 
um, you just kind of overall get a view of it. It doesn't look like anything too special, just a bunch of lines. But he really had a way of directing you through the data to get you to understand what's going on. Because really, all these parts are all in this last chart, as you'll see as we go through it. Um, but he guides you through an explanation that gets you to understand the data. So we can see here, he's talking about how the sun controls the weather with the polar vo vortex, drought, and floods all in the same month. This visualization helps us explore how the sun plays a factor in this temperamental weather. So he's looking at the number of sunspots. And he's showing that it's pretty, it's kind of in a cycle, that it comes and goes. And since we started putting satellites out there, we've been able to measure some of this energy that comes and goes and follows that cycle of the sunspots. Another thing that kind of correlates with that is the amount of cosmic rays here. So once again, we have that same up and down pattern. So it's really directing us and giving us a lot of background as to what we're looking at. We don't really need to spend that much time figuring out what this means, he's telling us right here. And now he's looking at the average land and ocean temperature. And then at the very end, he lets us compare all these things together. So if we want to see sunspots versus cosmic rays, we can see exactly how close they correlate. And it looks like they have a pretty inverse relationship here. This is a really good example of him guiding us through, because really, all he needed to publish was this. But by giving us the context of taking us through all of these steps of the thought process, we really can connect with what's happening here much easier than we could have. So a kind of more sophisticated version, also from the same author, Matt Francis, um, that he does this kind of thing in. The recent visit of the day here. And it's about malaria. So on Friday was World Malaria Day, and he wanted to kind of raise awareness about it. So we can see here, he gives us a, a nice little description of what it is, why we care about it. And then for every single map that he has on here, he kind of gives us why he's showing us this. So here's all the places it affects. He tells us where's all the places people get malaria in the United States, how many people are dying from it, what that means. So giving us all this information in context with what it means to him. So this is really, really good guided storytelling. And all of this, all he really did here, if we look at his dashboard, so we can see, you know, there's um, sheets for all of those different maps and the bar chart, line chart. But all of this stuff, these are just text boxes. All he's doing is adding the text around it. So he never had to write a full blog post and publish it as the full blog post. All he had to do was to show this one biz and it made sense to everyone. Um, no context needed. All the context is there in the biz. Um, and it's almost, you know, we talk a lot about when you're doing five second little dashboarding, sometimes you want the whole thing to be able to fit on the page so that they can look at it and get it. But sometimes you want people to take a little bit longer with your data and to really think about it and read through it. And so doing this kind of style that he started developing of doing this extra tall dashboard, so you kind of look at one thing at a time. You read it, you look at it, you read it, you look at it. Um, really interesting way of doing this. Okay, 
my kind of final example here of storytelling um, is kind of a more advanced technique here that you can do. So um, we haven't talked too much about getting tab views in here, but I'll show you kind of how we do that. So this is a dashboard um, by a man named Steve Wexler, the Pablo Zen master. You can see you may have this button here, and just click here to begin. And if we click it, it brings us to the next piece where he's made one dashboard, talks about where are all the STDs and HIV cases. And we can stop and play with this. We can hover over here and he kind of tells us what's going on here. And then we can move on. So he has another button here. We click it and it moves on. So he's guiding us through the data and really first giving us you know, a very overall view and now telling us exactly how many people are having it, when people got different diseases. You know, it seems like there was a boom in chlamydia, but AIDS is going down, so that's good. So let's take a look at his dashboard and see how he did this. So the first concept you're going to need to know when making these kinds of buttons that go through dashboards is you're going to need to know how to make tabbed views. Um, you remember, whenever you space the tablet public, so if I was to say save to the web as, and I log in, there's this checkbox that says show sheets as tabs. And what that means is that anything that's down here as tabs is going to become tabs up here. Why they're at the top here and in the bottom in the software, I'm not really sure, but that's how they are. So that's the first thing you know. That's how you turn your sheets into tabs. However, when you do that, anything that's down here is going to be turned into a tab. So um, you had, for example, this sheet showing, this would now become its own tab. Not necessarily something you want because it's not going to fit in there very well because it's not on a dashboard. So it's not going to be sized to the dashboard and arranged like you want. So what Steve Wester has done, you can notice if I click off the sheet, it's hidden. So any sheet that you put in your dashboard, once it's on a dashboard, you can hide it. So if I make a new sheet, do some stuff here. I'm not going to be able to hide it because it's not on a dashboard. All I can do is delete it. But take one of these and I'll unhide it for now. Because this map is on a dashboard, I can right click and say hide sheet, and then it goes away. So any sheets that are hidden when you publish won't be available to view just on their own. So you're going to be doing this kind of dashboard with navigation through it. Hiding sheets is a very good idea. So now, how do the buttons actually work? How does this take you to the next sheet? and so on. What he's actually doing here is looking is doing a dashboard access. So a lot of times if you're ever reverse engineering a dashboard and you're just like, this is doing something, it makes it go over here. How does it do that? 99% of the time the answer is going to be with a dashboard access. So if we open up dashboard and action, you can see there's an action here that says search. So start is the name of the sheet that has this click to begin thing here. So let's go to this sheet and see what it is. So all we have is a row. On rows, we have a thing called start. And if we look at what that is, the calculated field 
that just says click here to begin. So similar to when we're making our hover help menus that I showed you last week, he's just making kind of a placeholder calculation. The value is always just click here to begin. And then he made a made it into a shape and just changed that shape into an arrow so that it looks kind of like a next thing. Like we could have made the shape anything we wanted, but the arrow kind of makes sense. It's like an arrow or a play button. It makes you think you want to move on. So using that sheet, he was able to create a dashboard action that when you click on it, it moves to the next one. And what you'll see is the source sheet is introduction. So that's the name of our dashboard here. But the target sheet are all the sheets on cases and weights by county, which you can see down here is our next dashboard. Um, so when we were talking about dashboard actions, um, before we were just going from one dashboard to a different sheet on the same dashboard, but you can actually have actions interact with different dashboards. So we're having the introduction sheet go to the target sheet. And we're filtering, we're technically filtering, but because there aren't really any values to this start um, calculation, it's not actually going to filter anything because the, every row has the same click here to begin. If we look at the next view here, so next one is the other, is the next sheet that we're going to do this action with. And again, he's just created a calculated field that just says click to move to the next view and then put a little triangle there. And if we look at the dashboard action, you can see there's one here for next one. And the source sheet is cases and rates by county, which is the current dashboard we're on. And the target sheet is the Parado analysis, which is the next dashboard. So all he's doing is saying we're moving from this dashboard to this one whenever someone clicks that little arrow. And he does that over and over again to get this whole storytelling feel to his dashboard. So that's how we made that one. A cool thing that's not available in Tableau yet, but it's coming up and will make it easier to do this kind of dashboarding called Story Points. So we announced it um, at our last customer conference, and it's actually going to be in the very next version of Tableau, um, which is set to come out here very soon, along with the Mac version. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little bit of this video here that kind of goes through what story points look like. Um, you won't be able to hear it. But you see there's kind of this bar up here that has some different points of the story, so the cost of an operation can vary dramatically. So when he has that selected, this is the dashboard that's showing. He moves on. Talking a lot. And so once the dashboard is showing, they can actually interact with everything that's happening here. Stop, you take a look at what's happening. But then if they click on the next one, it changes the dashboard and it changes what you're looking at. And now they can stop and interact with this. So the next point is breathing operations vary the most in California. So operations here in California, there's about 143,000 different between these different procedures. You can click on the next one and see where are these places that vary a lot. You can see there's hospitals that are literally a block from each other, but there's a $30,000 difference. Um, between these two procedures. So story points is something that's coming up, and it's what's going to create this bar here that you can just click through, make kind of your points, and bring people through. And you can either put different dashboards, you can have someone going through different filters. So this would have been great for, you know, I had that dashboard um, about recipes for Thanksgiving. So here it is right here. Um, 
So I had this dashboard of Thanksgiving recipes, and there were some interesting findings here, but without something like story points, I didn't really point them out. I pointed them out in the article that we wrote out about, but I could have said stuff about, you know, look where sweet potato pie is con concentrated in the South, and then I could have made another story point of when we go to salad that points out these three states that consider jello salad as salad. Um, so this was already a fun exploratory dashboard, but all it would have taken is something like that, some call outs that tell you, that, hey, look at the specific thing, and that would really change the way storytelling happens. Okay, that's pretty much all the thoughts I have on storytelling. Any questions before I move on? So the next thing I'm going to talk about um, is kind of about publishing and just making sure that everyone's doing that correctly. Okay then, so moving on, let's talk about common pitfalls when you're publishing, ways you can avoid that. So first, if you guys haven't tried to look at your Tableau public profile yet, I really recommend that you do and that you try to keep it updated and keep it clean because I don't know if you noticed, but at the bottom of visits when they're published, The bad example is really slow to load. So there's this little link that says see more by this office. And when you open that, it opens up your Pablo public profile. And you can turn that link off if you want to, and I'll show you that in a second. But because that link is there, you might want to consider keeping this up to date, saying, you know, filling out your about me, filling out your different links here and making sure that anything that you aren't ready for the public to see yet is hidden. So the way you do that is on your public profile. Once you log in to Tableau Public, there's a button up here that says Edit Profile. You can see I've hidden a lot of things that aren't ready to be published yet. And from here, we can do a lot of other things. So if I go to my workbook, there's a lot of useful tools that I have for all of my dashboards here. So let's take a look at one of my dashboards here, so my most recent one. Um, here, you can change some of the settings in your footer. So the first setting you can change is show the toolbar. What the toolbar is are these icons right here. So this first one means export, so that's how someone gets an image or data from your dashboard here. And then this is the refresh button, so whenever you make something, someone gets somewhere and they're like, wait, how do I go back to what it looked like originally? What they do is click that little refresh button. So hiding the toolbar gets rid of those two things. The next thing we here have here is show the author byline. If you uncheck this, then the whole little see more by this author's text won't be there. Um, the other option we have here is show sheets as tabs. So if you accidentally check show sheets as tabs and you don't want them to show, you can uncheck that in this view here of the My Workbook section of Tableau Public. Another thing that you have here that I would really encourage all of you to do, especially when you're publishing this on your new site, is you can permalink your article. So when you do this, show you what it kind of compare the difference between a permalink one and non-permalink one. So you can see that when I look at my public profile, there's this published on, published on. This one doesn't have one. So if I look at, for example, this workbook, my fake data about cat's workbook. You can see that the article, 
that uses this dashboard loads behind it. And I can X out and I can read the article. So that's a very useful thing to do when you're publishing um, on your own website. If you don't do that, what happens is when someone opens up one of your dashboards that isn't permalink, it'll open on what's called the Viz homepage. So the Viz homepage, page right here, it gives you a title, says who it's by, gives me my sheet titles. So this is a little tax calculator. You can type how many, how much you paid in taxes and see exactly where your money went. So that's the difference between something that's permalink and not permalink. So I really recommend that you permalink things. Okay, the last thing I wanna tell you about, about kind of a common pitfall that I see in people publishing, um, I see pretty often is sometimes when you want to embed your dashboard, the natural thing to do is, hey, there's this share button. And if I do that, it gives me an embed code. The problem with this, doing it this way, is that the, e the, the URL it generates is this shared and then kind of a random string URL. This is not a permanent URL. What this actually is, is um, we want people to be able to share when they get to a certain view. So let's say I was using this tax calculator and I paid like, $2,499 in taxes. And I thought, wow, I paid $830 to Social Security. I want to tell my friends that if I hit share and take that specific link, it actually opens it up with that value I put in here. So when you use the share, the share button, it's actually saying whatever your viz looks like at the moment you hit the share button, that's what I'm going to do. And that's why it's not permanent because if we saved it every time someone did that, there would be a lot of copies of this dashboard. So when you're embedding things, instead of using that share button, what you should do is go to your workbook, go to the My Workbook section, find the dashboard you want to embed, and then you click on it, it'll give you the actual embed code. So you see this link here does not have that shared thing. The typical way that things are named in Tableau are public.tableausoftware.com slash views slash the name of your workbook slash the name of your sheet. And that's what you want to embed. So this is the embed code you should always use. If you embed from the shared code, it's going to work initially, but in about three or four months, that link is going to get reset and your viz is gonna disappear. You're going to get a little thing that says, where's the viz? And you're going to be sad. You don't know where the viz is. So always use this embed code. This is the same embed code the Tableau gives you when you first publish it in the desktop and that box pops up, um, that embed code is safe too. Just don't use the shared embed code to publish. Okay, any questions about any of that stuff? Okay, great. Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of graduation. So now that you finished the course, um, there's a couple things that I wanted to do for you guys. One, I want to make you a little certificate that says you completed the course. Um, so I'm going to do that for you. Another thing I wanted to do for you is if you add me on LinkedIn, and I'll post all of this on the Reddit to kind of remind you to do this. But if you add me on LinkedIn and put Tableau as a skill, I will endorse you for that. Um, but the only way you're going to get your certificate and get my endorsement that you know stuff about Tableau is if you finish all five assignments. And no rush to finish them. I know that you guys all have your own schedules and deadlines that you've got to work with. 
but you know, anytime in the next couple of months, as soon as you finish the five assignments, um, I will endorse you. So speaking of five assignments, you should probably have a fifth assignment before <laughs> you try to finish the class. Um, your last assignment is just going to be show me what you learned. So use your own data, make anything you want. Um, see if you can get some directed storytelling in there since that was this week kind of lesson here. So put a lot of text. I want to be able to completely understand your dashboard without you giving me any outside context. I want you to just give me the link and I should be able to understand it. So that's your assignment. Um, so before we finish up our lesson today, um, I want to talk to you about just how you can keep learning and keep up with Tableau stuff. So the first thing that you should do, make sure that you follow what happens on our Tableau public um, website here. So it's not a blog. It has a lot of tutorials. Every month we do kind of a theme. So this month's theme was not super themey. It was just tips. So we gave a lot of tips. Next month we're going to be talking about quantified cells. The month before that we talked about um, sports. So lots of different kinds of tips here. And following this of the day is also another really good thing because you can do like we've been doing this whole lesson of downloading someone's workbook, reverse engineering it, and really seeing how did they do that. Um, I find that that's the way I learned this is just by trying to figure out how other people did things. Um, another thing that you can do here at the blog, and um, I will post this as well. So a couple months ago, we had blogging month. So everyone who kept a Tableau blog, oh, here. Here we go. anyone who kept a Tableau blog, we added them to this map. And if you go here, you tableausoftware.com slash public slash tableau public data blog. This is a huge wealth of knowledge, just people to follow that will give you awesome tips. Um, so I use an aggregator called Feedly. So if you don't know, um, if you used to use something like Google Reader, that's what Feedly does, puts everything kind of in one place for you to read it. So I just went through and subscribed to all these blogs via Feedly. Um, and that's a really good thing to do to keep up with kind of what's happening. If you have specific questions and you want someone's help, um, first, always feel free to email me or call me. You know, you guys pretty much have my contact information. So that's step one. Um, step two is to go to the Tableau forum. So it's just community.tableausoftware.com. There's always a ton of people hanging out here that are super, super helpful. Um, so you can come in here and basically ask any kind of question. And usually someone will come and help you. Someone else who's another user will come and help you. The last thing is, I find I have a lot of good luck just simply Googling things. So if I'm trying to figure out like how to, for example, use a parameter to switch measures. All I have to do is type parameter, switch measure, Tableau. And it usually comes out pretty good. Um, so don't be afraid to just Google things. Make sure you pop, pop Tableau in there. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's all I've got for you guys today. I have a short lesson. Um, so any last questions before? We close up here. The office hours are going to be tomorrow and again on Friday. I think I have like three different two hour chunks set up. So feel free to stop by. All right, well, it's really been a pleasure having you guys in my class. 
seeing how much you've grown. Do yourself a favor, look at the assignment you sent in for week one and compare it to the assignment you sent in for week four and just see like you guys have all come a really long way. So that's awesome and I'm so proud of you. And I'm here for you as you continue learning. So anytime you're working on a project, you have a question, feel free to just email me. All right, guys. So that's all I got. So take care. Happy visiting. Bye.